All right, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a backstory of my practice and how I've kind of come into the bio art field, um, starting with um, my great grandparents' homestead, which is on the property that I grew up on. Um, it was my first kind of um, there it is. Um, I I was lucky enough to grow up on this land where my my great grandparents had immigrated to Canada too. I kind of became interested in spirituality, presence and physicality, as well as death, decomposition, and the body, as well as human presence. Um, so this property kind of formed my early relationship with yeah philosophy overall. So what one of the um, first pieces that I produced that really uh, was a, a big moment in my art practice um, was this piece which is called the sum of the parts and I was really interested in gestalt theory so I was kind of looking at how the sum of a group of objects can create a presence so when a lights cast on this sculpture uh, it casts my silhouette um, then I kind of kept going with this idea of of the fallen down kind of decomposing structure, the house structure as metaphor for the body. So I was looking at the difference between the house and the home and the body and the soul. And so I, I did this series of silk screens um, juxtaposing uh, my body and um, decomposing buildings. Um, this, this I at the time, I was really interested in Aristotle's theory of de anima, which is kind of based in the concept that all objects have a soul and and um, and now in later years I realized that that's anti-theological anti binary um, so that's a term meaning the divide between organic and inorganic and theorists that I'm really interested in at the moment are, are people who kind of um, break that binary so then I kind of, in my practice, I fluctuate between looking at physical material and then, um, uh, you know, other material. So I, I started making this series of wedding dresses. Um, this flipped my focus from, um, yeah, physical structure to the body as a membrane. Um, so as a responsive organism that is incorporated in the landscape around it. Um, so. This kind of shifted my focus from the anthropocentric uh, into, into kind of, yeah, a spiritual experience. So my, my aunt had a conversation with me uh, where she told me that she had not married a man, that she had married a lake because she'd married my uncle who was a fisherman. And, um, and I became really obsessed with this idea of finding a way to quantify experience through a physical form, through a physical membrane. Um, and so the perfect metaphor being the wedding dress to the wife. Um, so I thought, uh, I, I tried to make these objects that were reflective of experience as a quantifier. Um, and then I, I started building sculptures uh, that were back to kind of houses. Um, I was having these recurring lucid dreams that, that uh, I later felt were maybe prophetic and and so by looking at them through kind of Jungian theory of the subconscious and then looking at consciousness and unconsciousness I was I was really interested in in making physical objects that could act as representation um, so this one was based on a, a dream that I'd had where uh, I realized that through doing dream analysis that I was I was afraid of um, not being able to protect someone dear in my life and and then a couple of months later he was in a house fire and and I kind of had this mind-blowing experience of, of wanting to be able to quantify that and so I spent a lot of time kind of um, yeah in in research um, and then I, at the same time, this was during the last year of my degree, uh, last year, um, I was working on uh, the skin as membrane again and looking at the difference between organic and inorganic and where you could create kind of an, a, a liminal space between the two. So this was a, just a sculpture 
that was made of entirely um, inorganic material um, in a way to kind of talk about uh, the bacteria of the body and the way that the body fights itself uh, from within itself. So I, I um, had some health and, and then mortality issues. I had a, a major health concern come up during that time, and I was trying to find a way to find physical form to express that experience as po a potential space to have discussion with others about their experience. So, um, so again, this kind of dealt with uh, theories in abjection and, and unconsciousness and subconsciousness. Um, and then I went away to the BAMP Center in uh, the fall, and I was able to spend the time that I really wanted to devoted to looking at philosophy and, and theory. And um, while I was there, I was, I was really looking at metaphysics and pseudoscience, um, particularly vitalism, which is um, the study of living organisms and showing how they are different from non-living organisms because of something outside of principles governing inanimate objects, so therefore the vital spark. So I was really interested in what is the difference and how do we kind of understand that. And I started reading um, a lot of theories for and against it and looking at modern versions of that because that's more of like um, a concept rooted in um, in kind of like the 1800s. So it's it's been disproven and uh, there's been much warranted dispute about this. So Francis Crick, who was the co-discoverer of DNA in, in 1967 said, what everyone believed yesterday and you believe today, only cranks will believe tomorrow. And that kind of really got me going. I, I, I was like, oh, well, I agree with that entirely, but I, I also think that you could be arguing the exact opposite point. And so then I started looking for theorists who, who did argue the opposite point. And, um, and I came up with Jane Bennett and Elizabeth Groves, um, who both look back to vitalistic principles and specifically cite that as inspiration. Um, they're kind of feminist theorists who are looking at evolution and, and they uh, discuss ontological understandings, so of the philosophy of being, becoming, and reality. Um, in order to advance our understanding of what it means to exist as agents of life. Um, so, uh, someone who serves as an emblem of this for me is Mary Shelley. Um, I became very obsessed with Frankenstein. Uh, I, I feel as though she served as, as a kind of prophet of her era. She was a woman who stood outside of, um, outside of the scientific field, but was able and found authority in her own voice to uh, express concerns with progress for progress's sake in the technological advancements of bioelectric galvanization, which was where they were digging up dead bodies and trying to shock them back into life, which was this big arms race to kind of discover how to how to create life and this kind of Promethean mythology, uh, which she found pretty disgusting and was pretty disgusting as we find out they were the uh, cranks that we know today. Um, so uh, with both Groves and Bennett, um, I find that there are authors now that are kind of having these discussions uh, which serve a similar function as Mary Shelley did during her time now. So uh, I came home and talked to Malenti and realized that there was a toxicity workshop happening about bio art and I thought, well, gosh darn, if that's not exactly what I'm interested in right now. Um, and I'd never heard of bio art. And, um, and so yeah, it was, it was really exciting. So I came home and I started working on um, this piece, which is Relics of Frankenstein's Monster. Um, I'm, what, I've, what I've done is I've met with uh, um, Betsy Thorstensen at the Manitoba Museum. And talking to her and my mentor, Eleanor Bond, through the Malin Mentorship Program, which I was just in uh, last year, um, I was talking about plant matter, and I was talking about Promethean mythology and, and what it means to produce life and, and what's going on. I was really excited at the time about skins. I've always been interested in skin and clothing and, and membranes between our own body and, and the outside and how you can understand organic and inorganic and, um, and agency, how you can be an agent of your own existence. Um, 
so while I was while I was at the Bounce Center, uh, people that that or what I was really looking at was was these theorists who are interested in evolution and, and theory and philosophy of existence. Then I was kind of pushing it forward and trying to see if there are people now who are looking at um, pseudoscience and metaphysics in a way that's relevant so, so that it's not kind of a hokey or antiquated concept. And I found two examples that I was really excited about. I found, um, I found this organization called Wake Up, Call Me, Tell Me Your Dreams who are a sociological group in the States who you could call in and, and talk to them about your dreams. They'll ask you very direct, pointed questions about the content of what's going on in your subconscious. And, and through that, they quantify data and they're trying to find a way of predicting natural disasters because of the collective unconscious. And so far, they've, they, believe they have the data to, that substantiates the fact that they were able to predict the tsunami in Thailand. Um, so that was, that's one organization. And then I was also looking at the natural, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, who investigate complementary and alternative medicine healing practices in the context of rigorous scientific methodology. In training researchers in these fields, in disseminating authoritative information, um, in their fields to the public and professionals. So trying to find ways of focusing on whole medicine systems, mind-body medicine, manipulative and body-based practices, as well as biological-based practices and energy therapies. So things specifically related to like electromagnetic uh, healing or, or healing touch theories and, and kind of demystifying scientifically um, these, these pseudoscience kind of procedures. So looking at all of that, and then looking at Mary Shelley, I started plasticizing these hosta leaves. Um, so, so this was the, kind of the first inching into bio art that I've, I've done, and this isn't as much biotechnical work, because this is, it's, it's, not, it's not as um, based in technology. It's not laboratory-based practice, but it is bioart because it's manipulating living uh, procedures. So, um, so this piece, again, is kind of breaking that ontotheological binary that I was talking about, this inorganic and organic. It, it, what I've done is I've completely removed any material that is organic from the leaves, and I've replaced them and made them plastic. So in this way, um, I'm, I'm kind of creating an object that's this scientific specimen and um, imaginary saintly relic for me. Um, so then I took the toxicity workshop, and the first thing that we did uh, was we found out how to extract DNA from bananas, um, which seems sounds like a really big thing, but we just squished up a banana in a bag with like some alcohol, and then it just moves apart in this like goo, and that's its DNA. And it was like, oh, like that's as easy as it is. You know, it's not this big, mystical kind of intensive experience. It's just it's just very simple, and you're able to understand then this kind of um, philosophy of life by actually just looking at it. Um, it was really exciting. So then what we did was we took a bunch of petri dishes covered with agar, which is just a substrate that you can grow bacteria on, and we spat on it and like, you know, farted on it or like <laughs> stuck sticks in like some dirt and put the dirt on there and saw what we could grow. And we left it to gestate over the entire time we were in this workshop. And... Um, and then let it grow some more and kind of thought about the aesthetics of, of what, 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 it, yeah, what it looks like, what life looks like, what culture looks like. And we had these really wonderful philosophical conversations about Aristotle again, and, and I felt validated in my own small way for having thought about these philosophers right from the get-go and being like, yeah, okay, this is the root of, of existence. It's kind of these 
these philosophies and then applying it in this way that felt very foreign to me was just so exciting. Um, so you can see this is what my culture looked like by the end of the workshop. Um, and yeah, and so then we, at the same time, while we were waiting for this to culture, we were working with PGLO, which is, um, which is just a plasmid containing GFP. So earlier, uh, Malenti was talking about Alba, who is a rabbit that was, um, I don't know if she was actually injected with GFP or, yeah. In, in conception, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so GFP is green fluorescent um, protein, which is what scientists use to kind of uh, inject into bacteria to see, to watch it, to make sure that like, oh, it wasn't just that this, this bacteria culture just got sick uh, in and of its own accord. I injected this specific one with GFP so I can isolate it. It's just like a highlighter in science. And so we were working with GFP and E. coli. And uh, Nikki Spiro, who wrote an article in BioArt and was also one of the artists in Toxicity, but also running the workshop, does work where she draws out um, different kind of molec molecular structures, et cetera. So using this as an aesthetic medium. And if it isn't just so beautiful, you know, I'm, I, I'm, yeah, I found it really inspiring to just enjoy the simple aesthetic of science without it being this inaccessible point. Um, so then to kind of take a little bit of a break from like sewing together Frankenstein's monster and, um, and from working in the lab and taking a break from kind of, yeah, this heady research, um, I worked with Josh Ruth and we produ produced this print. It's a mono print where we were part of a show that was themed around pizza. And so it was this piece of paper that we put on top of a pizza that we cooked together and it soaked up the grease and some of the cheese and some of the toppings. And then we put it uh, over a, a light box and it was called That's Amore because you know, when the moon hits your eye, like a big pizza pie. Uh, but it was kind of playing with this aesthetic of science, and it was, I was just kind of having fun with it. Um, because I, I really do. I love looking at um, Petri dishes, and I love looking at science um, and having fun with it. Uh, so then I was accepted into a residency titled Biophilia, put on by the Aetana um, group. Uh, in Halifax, and um, and here is where I once again was kind of exploring biotechnical art. Although my art practice really isn't technical, it's bio. It is classified as bio art because it's the practice. It's a practice based in live tissues, bacteria, living organisms, life processes, and philosophies behind science. So while, while these are really interesting to me, um, I don't mean to make it seem as though I'm, I'm a, you know, a scientist. I'm really not. Um, so the first thing that we did when we got there was uh, start working with ghost fungus, which is a kind of fungus that you can inject into culture and produce, and it becomes this uh, bioluminescent mushroom. So what you're seeing on this side of the screen is the mushroom growing, so all this like beautiful fuzzy bits are the fungus itself. And so when you bring it into your bathroom in the dark, it starts glowing. And um, yeah, and it was a lot of fun to work with. So this, this evening has been themed an evening of wanderings because I tend to wander, as I'm sure you're noticing in my practice, but also conversationally. Um, I like to explore. I really like to experiment. And so that's what this was. This was a really excellent opportunity for me to explore a field that I don't have access to, that you don't have access to necessarily. Um, so what we were doing was kind of breaking down, and Melanti talked about this earlier, um, but, but bio art is a way of, of kind of bringing in or, or uh, creating a, a DIY way of looking at science because it isn't always the easiest to get into a lab, um, you know, unless you're very adept at winking and meeting the right men uh, or women. <laughs> or, um, but so anyways, one of the first um, experiences 
of bio art that we did was with this ghost fungus. So I'm just gonna explain to you here, what we have is a, um, a sterile laboratory and it's on a kitchen table, super accessible, it's super easy to do at home, but, but you wouldn't think that you would have the capability of producing a sterile environment uh, to grow fungus, et cetera. So it's just, it's just simple supplies that you bring in using uh, al rubbing alcohol on your needles, using flames, um, and and yeah. And so we injected some containers with fungus, and then I grew it at home, and it was beautiful and made me see life in a different way. And I hope you all try this at some point. It's very easy. You can order it online. Um, so then I also, wandering around on the beach, found a bunch of squid eggs and collected them because I knew that I would have access to the bio lab at Acadia University uh, through this program. So these squid eggs, um, I hope the photo's clear enough. Um, these squid eggs look so beautiful under a microscope. So this was my first experience of kind of photographing using uh, microscopic technology. Uh, which is part of what the first workshop in the bio art chapter is going to be doing at the herbarium at the University of Manitoba starting this weekend. And we'll be exhibiting work um, in February from what takes place during the workshop. Um, so there we'll be using the plant specimens that the herbarium is graciously letting us, giving us access to and uh, photographing, but then also just making responsive work with regards to that experience. So. Um, so yeah, I, another DIY uh, tool that I was working with at the time was using um, little lenses to put onto your iPhone. So, so it's not this like really, it wasn't this really fancy hoity-toity kind of residency. It was very, very DIY and very kind of responsive, which I was excited about. Um, and then we got into the bio labs and I felt horrified. I felt completely like I couldn't touch anything. I felt like this aesthetic, uh, this aesthetic is really appealing to me in a lot of ways, but it also feels very, um, yeah, sterile and inaccessible. And, um, and, and then I remembered back to working with uh, Nikki Spiru and at, in, during the toxicity workshop and, and, you know, inoculating green culture with that, that bioluminescent mushroom and, um, and then I just found it kind of funny. Like the more you look around in science labs, uh, the more humor you find. Like it's it's somebody's moose skull that they found kicking around in there that they haven't really cleaned off, and there are like little bits of brain kind of dried on it, and like you know people's home jars that they uh, pickle their specimens in. It's it's nothing. It's nothing too too fancy. Um, and we were able to start photographing our own uh, things that we'd gotten from home. So I showed you before the squid eggs that I was kind of photographing. And then this is just iPhone photos through the microscope lens of a crystal that we'd harvested on the cliffs and some lichen. And this was the fancy setup, which again made me feel completely at home because it's some guy's like dirty cooler that he like hauls fish guts around in that's covered in mud that he's resting his laptop on um, and and that's how we got to take some really beautiful photos so this is some crystal that I'd harvested from Amethyst Cove like a pickaxe um, and then a barnacle um, and then uh, a moth and the reason that I have two photos up for you is um, because we were able to play with the depth of field. So looking at the legs, um, I really wanted to focus on the legs, and then I really wanted to focus on the wing, uh, which isn't as clear on the screen here, but on my computer it makes a, lot, a little, maybe a little bit more sense. Um, but to me, this was this was kind of like an aha moment about science, where where. Um, it shows bias. So if I'm the kind of scientist, like if, if I take, if someone said to you, you know, just take a photograph through a microscope of this specimen, you can take it, but there is still a depth of field. There's still this room for interpretation. There's room for bias. So if I'm just like somebody who's really into moth legs, like I'm gonna focus on that as opposed to the wings, right? Like, 
Um, so, so it kind of, yeah, it's kind of this moment of aesthetic choice in science that, that we wouldn't maybe think about necessarily. So it was just a little, little aha moment for me. Uh, so then I came home and I started thinking, uh, this is my business card. Um, I started thinking about everything that I'd been learning about and what I'd been researching and what was really interesting to me. And so I came up with this quote which says, authority rests within an individual's own reason and critical analysis. And I was, I was looking, um, I was kind of looking at this experience of the sterile laboratory and the fact that you can, you can have the sterile laboratory at home, you can like play around with fungus, you can create just as good science at home um, or with Nikki Spiro or, you know, wherever, wherever you are. And, um, and you don't need that authority of that space. You don't, you can be looking at microscopes through somebody or on top of somebody's dirty cooler and it's just as legitimate. Um, so it kind of, yeah, it, it, so I started working on this project called Iatro Regenerism, which is the body of work that I'm working on right now. So it's based in um, this understanding of cultural iatro uh, genesis, which refers to the destruction of traditional ways of dealing with and making sense of death, suffering, and illness. In this way, the medicalization of life leads to cultural harm as society members lose their autonomous coping skills. So I was looking at science, but I was also looking at the medical model and, and feeling very critical of it. And this is one of the offshoots of it. So, um, so you have this, you have these systems that are in place that make it inaccessible to heal yourself. You have these systems put in place that make it inaccessible to understand even the simple vocabulary <coughs> of science. Um, you know, I'm I'm always really thankful to hear Prabha and to hear Malenti talk, but sometimes I don't know the words because that's not my vernacular and it's not a common vernacular. But it's it's very simple once you kind of get interested in it. Um, so I've started creating a bunch of different kinds of work um, about this and trying to posit um, a shift. So that's what I call iatro regenerism. So cult cultural iatrogenesis works, I want to create positive solutions to it. Um, so the first piece that I really worked on was this zine um, at the Yellow Dog. I work there quite often. And, um, and it was this pragmatic breakdown of a spell that I cast. So I, I thought, I'm gonna cast this spell. I know that to be legitimate in my own personal experience. Like I, I, I have certain, certain beliefs or, or I have certain interests at least in, in different cultures. So, so spiritual, spirituality and philosophy um, being two of those major realms. Um, it's where I spend a lot of my time dabbling. It's what I think about when I'm foraging in like the forest or when I'm um, sewing together plasticized leaves. Um, so I decided that I would cast this spell because I was feeling uh, lovelorn. I was feeling heartbroken. And so I thought, well, what if I can figure that out? What if I know if this is not, if I'm, what I'm feeling is not reciprocal? Um, because I can't know that in my consciousness so what if I know it in my subconsciousness? How can I bring this forward? So I practiced this spell, and this was the this is the spell here, but you can't really see it, unfortunately. Um, so I broke it down pragmatically. So uh, the scientific method the scientific method is based in pragmatism, which is a philosophy, and pragmatism is um, I'll read you a little definition. Uh, pragmatism is a rejection of the idea that thought serves the function of describing and representing and instead is the product of interaction between organism and environment. So this is that ontotheological point. This is the difference between organic and inorganic. It's thought. So, um, so therefore thought functions as a tool for prediction, action, and problem solving. Uh, so that's what I'm working on. I'm trying to find, uh, I'm trying to make solutions to problems that I see. I'm, I'm trying to predict um, in kind of a humorous way, but also what, I, what I'm feeling like is a pretty legitimate way. And, and then I'm publishing it because that's the aspect of science that, that draws a very sharp parallel to art, in, in my opinion, is that to make good science, you need to disseminate your information and your findings. 
in art you need to exhibit or publish. Um, you know, this goes to all culture. You need to present it to the public and why. It's so that you can disseminate your thoughts, but it's also so that you can set it up to others to let you know if what you're doing is bullshit. And, uh, and maybe it bears some criticism. And then you take that and you think about it and you solve those problems. And then it becomes this really positive, solution-oriented culture, um, but only if you put it out there. So then I hosted uh, an evening, which I called uh, Fortuna's Bar 9, where I produced Love Potion Number 9. Uh, I looked up and did a lot of research into what the actual potion was. And I was noticing that a bunch of my friends were heartbroken and like, and you know, looking for love. And so I thought I would solve it by making love potions. And then I, so I created my sterile laboratory, which I think is pretty legit, um, you know? And then I started brewing. So uh, my friend Kaylin, who's sitting in the front here, uh, was my triage nurse. So I looked at the model of, of medicine that we have in place, and I thought, well, I'm gonna try to apply it to the best of my ability. And so I um, created this questionnaire. So there's an intake form. So you fill out the intake form, and then based on the information that you give me, I would use Love Potion Number Nine as the base, but then also I would add in elements of Manitoba herbology that I'd been foraging and collecting for a really long time. And I would infuse it, and then I'd talk to you about it, and then you'd drink it, and then I would do a follow-up. Um, I have since, I have since had one confirmed participant tell me that they've fallen in love because of my Love Potion. <laughs> So you do the math. Um, no, but I, I'm doing all of, I do all of this kind of collection so that I'm able to quantify um, my results. So the next evening that I did was just a couple of weeks ago uh, where I did something called graphological tassiomancy, uh, which is this kind of blend of graphology, which is the study of line interpretation. So it's, it's this... Uh, the police used to use it more, they still do, but they used to use it more, um, where they would study handwriting analysis. So looking at the pressure that you put on, so you must have been really stressed out when you wrote that like note, um, or, or you know, the way that the line bends in a certain way, they had ways of analyzing it. So I did a lot of research into it, and then I also was feeling really um, inspired because the backstory of, of what, I, what I'm doing is, I, I come from this long line of like Icelandic, like mystic kind of women who believe very strongly in fortune telling. And uh, one of the methods that, that they would use was coffee readings. So they would look at your coffee cup and they'd be able to tell you the truth. And my grandmother, my Amma, um, knew everything. She just knew it all, and there was no way of quantifying it, and I had, no, I had no understanding of how to kind of make sense of it. So I'm, so I'm setting up methods where I can understand uh, that, but, but outside of that as well. I mean, I'm, I'm just interested in, in understanding the difference between inorganic and organic if we all contain bacteria, and so therefore we're inorganic and organic at the same time anyways, you know? Um, so I'm looking at it through a scientific lens now. So what I would do is I would boil up some coffee with this uh, cool old percolator that I have, and then I would, um, I would flip the coffee cup upside down and let it cure on the paper. So it would create this mono print. And then I'd put it up on my uh, x-ray chart and I would graph it out, and then I would analyze it. Um, and so looking at kind of so inventing this methodology that has roots in very legitimate um, realms, but also these pseudoscientific realms, I would, I would see if I could tell the future. And I've got another very intense form uh, based on S-bar, which my stepdad showed me. Um, but then also um, intuition. I've, I'm kind of analyzing to see if I can read people's futures. Uh, scientifically and 
so that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. I, I'm interested in pseudoscience and the aesthetic of science and authority and who's the authority. You're your own authority as long as you you critically analyze and have reason and you know really think it through. Then you're the authority. Um, so that's what I'm interested in, and this backing is part of why I'm developing this bio art chapter. It's because these are conversations that I like to have, and I, I like to break down walls, and I like to talk to scientists, and um, I like to talk to artists, and I just like to talk. So I figured this would be a good space to start for me. So we're starting at the herbarium at the University of Manitoba, like I mentioned before. But we're developing a workshop series where, we, um, where we're giving you access to any number of realms. Um, you simply have to talk about what you're interested in. So if, if you would like to be a part of the BioArt chapter, we do have a Facebook group. Um, there's an email address. Um, it's bioart at videopool.org. And, and just ask. And we can try to break down those barriers because it should be accessible to talk about science, to be in labs, and to utilize um, that kind of equipment. Helga, like your first pro the project you showed with the plastination. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, are you aware of the uh, plastin uh, Ginter von Hagen's uh, plastination uh, practice theory. I don't know if yeah. I know. Can you, you give the, me more context? Uh, well, uh, Ginter von Hagen uh, looks very much like Joseph Beuys, but isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, really. First time I saw him, I was like, <laughs> "Oh my God, this is like a clone." Uh, but he, he developed this uh, technology where you basically take all the water uh -huh. uh, from the human body and you uh, insert acetates and you therefore you plast plastinate them. Mm -hmm. And there was this uh, huge exhibition which was oh, going all around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but also there yeah. were, uh, but there are others, you know, more, I think, artistic ways of how you can uh, use that technology, but uh, perhaps it's something you would uh, like to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I would like to do a lot of things. I have a friend who takes, uh, <laughs> takes like skin samples and then uh, uses, I don't know if you guys know the skin gun, but it's what they're using now instead of grafting skin onto people. There, It's this gun that just like sprays skin and I have this like Rambo fantasy about it, but, um, <laughs> but really, <laughs> but really he's, he's using it so he sprays these molds that he takes of his friend's face and then uh, takes skin samples from his friend's butt and then he says butt face. It's, you know, I, <laughs> there are lots of really great ways of using the technology. <laughs> <Huge. Sorry>. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a choice. Uh, what happens is, I, I suppose there are certain elements. I mean, I, I couldn't quantify exactly which parts, but I believe the stem has more organic material left over because it just doesn't, it's more hardy and doesn't want to replace as easily. But it's a very simple process where it's this pickling solution that I use where um, because of the uh, chemicals that I put into it, it it's, it's, um, it's very simple, but it removes there's this alcohol in it that removes all of the moisture from in the leaf and therefore removes the organic material in, in its place and then it puts glycerin in. So it just kind of like is the cyclical process of removal. So over enough time, then it just becomes this glycerin leaf. So I don't know exactly the percentage of what, what is organic and what isn't. And I like that. I think that really works with the project that I'm doing. But, but if, I, if I really wanted to utilize it and make something very, very plastic, um, I, would, I, would love, I would love to do things like Plastination, which Malenti was talking about, and actually figure out the percentages. But for this project, I didn't feel it was necessarily important to know. Well, uh, I think. I think I'll leave it there. If you feel like you want to talk to me after, please feel free to. And thank you, Malenti and Prabha.